This is so nice. This is such a special night. There's a lot of brown people here. Perfect. This is who I send messages to. This is what I wanted. I'll be honest, I always feel more comfortable in a room with many brown people. And I think that's normal, right? Whenever I'm in a new environment, I just look for people who look like me. Like when a brown guy walks into a room, he's gonna think, are there brown people here? When a black guy walks into a room, he's gonna think, are there black people here? When a white guy walks into a room, he's gonna think, are there black people here? <laughs> right, super uh, common. I like having those moments with brown people, you know, but sometimes the issue is I can't reciprocate. Like I live in New York now, and sometimes I'll get into an Uber or a taxi, and there'll be a brown guy driving, and he'll see my brown face, and he'll be like, this guy gets it. But I'm not an immigrant, you know? So I'll get in the car and he'll be like, I miss my family. And I'm like, I don't know what that feels like, <laughs> you know? Like one time in New York City, I got into an Uber and there was a Sikh guy driving. Those are the guys who wear the turbans, right? And his phone was hooked up to his windshield and it was on speaker, so everybody could hear everything he was doing. First thing he does in the car is he calls a long distance number to India. And then another Indian dude picks up and then the driver goes, Hey, Baji, chal gana lagate? which roughly translates to, hey friend, let's play a song. And then I thought that they would just like turn on the radio and jam out together. That's not at all what happened. The Indian dude on the other end just started singing a Bollywood song at the top of his voice. Then the driver joined in. Now these two are in a romantic duet and I don't know what to do, right? As it turns out, I know the song. So do you. The song is India's version of My Heart Will Go On. So naturally, I gotta jump in the game. And now it's three grown ass men in an Uber. Just like, Abatum hi ho, Abatum hi ho, Zindagi, Abatum hi ho. And uh, the best part of this story is it was an Uber pool. <laughs> So there was a white girl in the back. <laughs> we looked at her, she was like, can you guys just let me off here, please? <laughs> the driver was like, we're crossing a bridge, ma'am. <laughs> she was like, I know, I wanna jump off. <laughs> yeah. I don't mean to shit on white people. A lot of white people came tonight. That's really awesome, I didn't expect that, that's great. <laughs> that's great, it really is. I'm actually, I'm dating a white girl. And uh, people always ask me, they're like, Zane, you're brown. Is it tough to fly being brown? Is it tough to fly being brown? You know what's tougher? Is to see the kind of shit that hot white girls get away with at the airport, okay? <laughs> when my girlfriend and I travel, she just doesn't bring an ID and it's never been a problem. <laughs> One time we were traveling, she packed an entire bottle of shampoo in her carry-on, okay? The TSA agent took her bag, brought it to the side, opened it up, took the shampoo out. He said, ma'am, you know I can't let you through with this. And then she made direct eye contact with him and said, why, do you think it's a bomb? <laughs> I was in the back like, this bitch is gonna get me killed. And then she doubled down. She was like, is that what you think? It's a shampoo bomb? A coconut smelling shampoo bomb? And then, no joke, the TSA agent just laughed and said, you right, and then gave her the shampoo back. <laughs> if you ask me a question at the airport, I'm like, sir, yes, sir, I love this country. <laughs> yeah, and then, I, and then I start yelling the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> and this is what I say. I say, I pledge allegiance to the flag. There's less than three ounces in my bag. <laughs> That's what I say. So they know I'm one of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't, I don't mean to uh, shit on the TSA too much, though. I'm very patriotic. Like, a lot, there's a lot of first-born Americans here. For some reason, we're very patriotic, you know? Like, I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's something, I think it's just a privilege. Like, that's why I like traveling to other countries. Because, like, immigration can't tell from my face that I'm American, right? So they see me, and they're kind of nasty. They're like, sir, passport. And then I just slam that blue passport down <laughs> with that big gold eagle on it. And I'm like, fucking say something, bruh. <laughs> Say something right now. That's what I thought, Thailand. That's what I thought. <laughs> Dude, I'm so patriotic. I'm so patriotic that sometimes I just think about the moon landing when I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs>
the moon landing was the most gangster thing that's ever happened. Look, because when we landed on the moon, we didn't claim it on behalf of all mankind, right? We just put our own flag there, just like, finders keepers, bitch. That's awesome. You know what that means? That means that if we ever find life on the moon, technically it's American, which has got to piss off the immigrants. Because they're like, okay, you call us illegal aliens, but the literal alien is a citizen? Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, I need to learn English, but he communicates in beeps. Okay. Dude, if being on the moon made you a citizen, immigrants would find a way to get there. They're too hardworking. It would take one dude who's like, all right, if you're building a wall, I'm building a spaceship. And then six months from now, you turn on the TV and Anderson Cooper is like, after Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Jose Gonzalez is the third man on the moon. Over to you, Jose. And he's like, is uh, one pequeño step for man? One grande step for Mexico. That would be exciting. Everything, everything I tell on stage is true though. Like my girlfriend actually told that to the TSA all over a bottle of shampoo. And I remember thinking shampoo's not that important. And then I saw a shampoo ad and I realized women's shampoo is very important. Because every woman's shampoo commercial always starts the same way, right? It opens with a woman dressed in all white, tossing her hair in slow motion. But it's not all slow-mo, right? It's like regular speed, then they hit you with the slow-mo back to regular speed, right? Every woman's shampoo commercial starts like this, the one's like this. Right? And then the woman walks to the camera, she says, let me cool, she's like, L'Oreal, because you're worth it. They should be more honest with the messaging, right? It should be like, L'Oreal, it's in your price range. <laughs> That's what they mean. That's why I like the men's grooming commercials, because they just get straight to the point, right? They open with a woman in her underwear for no reason. And then it's just like a hard cut to a dude working out. And the dude's like, she's hot, right? You probably want to sleep with her. Same here, bro. And that's why you need Gillette razors. And you're like, what? Nobody shaved this entire time. You have a full beard. What is happening? Every men's grooming commercial is like, Gillette razors, what are you, gay? Right? I, you know, I don't even think men need that much marketing. I don't think we need it. I think the ideal men's commercial is a dude just walking up to the camera. He's like, hey, uh, we sell socks and you need socks. <laughs> and every guy would be like, he's got a point. <laughs> yeah, very solid marketing pitch. <laughs> so yeah, man, I'm in an interracial relationship. It's fun, it's cool. People always ask me, they're like, Zane, when your parents found out, when your mom found out, was your mom mad? Was your mom mad? No, man, my mom and I are really good friends. When I told my mom that I had a white girlfriend, in the situation, she acted like she was a high-powered attorney and I was a rich client and I had just messed up. I walked in the room, I was like, you're gonna wanna have a seat. She was like, what's going on, tell me. And I was like, I'm dating a girl. And she was like, girl, okay, good start. <laughs> we, we've been a little worried. What seems to be the problem? And I was like, she's white. And my mom was like, God damn. Now I gotta clean this mess up. How wide are we talking? I was like, her family owns a farm. Her family. <laughs> okay, all right, okay. We just need an alibi, we need an alibi. <laughs> what does she do professionally? And I was like, well, she's about to graduate Harvard Law School. And she was like, Harvard? <laughs> well then we might just turn this case around. <laughs> she was into it. You know, it's interesting. I grew up in the South, but the most racism I ever experienced was actually from another Indian girl. I was dating a Hindu girl in college, and I'm Muslim. Uh, look, I'm Muslim, but I'm not gonna stand up here and pretend to be perfect, okay? Occasionally, I drink and I smoke and I fool around, all right? I don't eat pork though, because I'm not a goddamn infidel. <laughs> I 
That's where I draw the line, guys. <laughs> so I was dating a Hindu girl, and uh, I leaned in to kiss her after the third date, and she stopped me. She goes, no, 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 no BMWs. And I was like, what does that mean? I drive a Honda Civic. <laughs> and she was like, no, no BMWs. BMWs is my dad's abbreviation. It means no blacks, Muslims, or whites. And I was so hurt, because I was like, how come the Mexicans get a free pass? You know what I mean? There's one M and we take it? That's not fair. I think you should encourage people you know to date outside of their race, outside of their religion. Because then you know what happens? You mix up the colors. And then you know what happens? You get more colors. And more colors is always better. You know how I know? Remember when we were kids and we all had that 24 pack of crayons? And then that one kid showed up with the 152 pack? <laughs> and everybody lost their goddamn minds. That's more colors. I'll never forget the day Jonathan Murphy showed up. He slammed that whole box down. All the kids gathered around. Oh my God, I've never seen this many colors in my life. <laughs> Periwinkle, I thought that was a myth. Burnt sienna, I don't even know what sienna is. One kid gets up, he's like, hey Jonathan, can I borrow your brown crayon? Mine's kind of dull. Jonathan goes, yours is dull, I'll take care of it. Grabs the crayon, flips the box over. There's a sharpener on the other side. Now kids are really losing their minds, right? One kid faints. Another kid takes out an inhaler. All the girls are like, oh my God, Jonathan, you're so hot. Even the teacher was like, that was sexy. <laughs> See me after class, Jonathan. Oh man. It was nice being raised in the South. Nobody was really mean to me or unkind or, you know, it was cool. I used to go to Noonan, Georgia a lot because that's where my dad owns a gas station, which sounds like a joke, but it's not. And <laughs> he owns a gas station down there. I like people in Noonan, Georgia, man. You can't insult them. What names are you gonna call them? Well, you can't say anything. Hey man, you're just a redneck, blue collar, white trash. They're like, all I heard was red, white, and blue, baby. <laughs> that's right, that's right. That's how we do it, right? Noonan, Georgia, baby. There's a lot of conservatives out there. I think conservatives get a bad rap, right? It's too easy to, to make fun of them nowadays. There's a lot of conservatives out there. They're good people. It's just that the world is changing very quickly and they can't always keep up, you know? Like I used to work with a guy like that. I used to work as a consultant. And I used to work with a very Southern, very conservative dude. And one night, he and I are at dinner with our client. And our client says that he's married and he has a son. It's like, interesting. A week later, it's just me and the client talking one-on-one. -on -one. And the client goes, I want to move out of my neighborhood because there's too many gays there. And I was like, whoa. And he goes, and as a gay man, I can say that. And I was like, oh, he has a husband and a son and I'm being ignorant, right? So later that day, I told the super conservative guy who was at dinner, I was like, hey man, did you know that the client is gay? And I saw this like look of confusion hit him. And he was like, wait, at dinner, I thought he said, he was married. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, I thought he said he has a son. And I was like, yeah. And I could see the wheels turning. And I was like, come on, man, you can do this. Do this. And he goes, and now you're telling me he's gay? And I was like, yeah. And then he goes, is his wife okay with that? Ah. Oh. So close. I was like, yeah, she's fine, baby steps. I've had, I've had good experiences in the South, you know? Like one time I went to church on Christmas Eve. It was an interesting story. My girlfriend called me. Christmas Eve, she said, your family's Muslim, you're not doing anything, you wanna come celebrate Christmas with us? And I was like, what are we gonna do? She was like, we're just gonna go to a place and hold a candle and sing some songs. And I was like, that sounds ambiguous and fun. Let's do it. <laughs> I drive up to her house, we get into her parents' car. Then we drive up to a church. A pastor greets me. He gives me a pamphlet that says, Christ is Lord. And I was like, I have been bamboozled. <laughs> I felt like I was in the movie Get Out. <laughs> I was like, you're trying to take my brain because I'm so good at math compared to you. <laughs> And I walked into that church on Christmas Eve, and sometimes I feel like I'm a casual Muslim, but walking into that Southern Baptist church, I went from being a casual Muslim to a business formal Muslim very quickly, right? They had a little roster where you could write your name. I wrote my whole name, Zain Akbar Muhammad Sharif. 
and I threw that pen down. My name is just Zane Akbar Sharif, but I was feeling it. I threw in the Muhammad. You know what I mean? Go big or go home, baby. And I sat in that church and I felt so guarded and defensive. I felt like I shouldn't be there. I felt like I was betraying some part of my identity by being there. And I looked at her and she was just so happy. And I was like, that's love. It's putting yourself out there in uncomfortable situations for people you care about. And so I sat in that church that day and I did what I had to. I sang those songs about how dope Jesus is. <laughs> and I learned some things. I learned that you're not supposed to clap between the songs. <laughs> Did you know that? I learned that they don't take requests like a DJ. You can't be like, yo, let me get Silent Night. I know the words. I learned that they really don't like it if you say the word debatable after everything the pastor says. <laughs> Pastor's like, we all agree Christ is the son of God. I'm like, ah! <laughs> Debatable, I have contrary evidence. I'm still very, very attached to my culture, my religion, my faith. It's, I mean, I grew up like that, you know? Like when I was growing up, every summer we would go to India, my whole family would go. And uh, in my family, it's me, my brother, my mom, and my dad. And uh, I'm the favorite child. I just know I am. You know, like my brother and I would argue over who our parents thought was cooler. And then one day my mom settled it. She walked in the room while we were playing with our Legos and she said, I just want you both to know that your father and I love Zane more. <laughs> my brother was so mad. He's like, well, if you love Zane so much, why'd you even have me? And she said, Zane needed a friend. <laughs> And so at that age, that young, I think my brother decided that one day he would prove that he's the better son. So that summer we're in India, I'm 10, my brother's six, and uh, every night we would play this game called Karam with the kids in the compound. And Karam, if you don't know, for the eight people here who don't know, <laughs> basically there's a little board and you flick pieces into pockets and if you get all the pieces in, you win, right? And I've got one piece, and Rizwan, who I'm playing with, has one more piece left. He's the king of the compound. He's number one, right? It's my turn. And if I hit this piece in, it's a big deal. Because I'm an American who went to India and beat an Indian at an Indian game. I'm playing for my country. <laughs> so I flick the piece and it hits the side of the board and it lands on its side and it starts rolling and rolling and rolling and then an inch away from the pocket, Rizwan does this. And the piece falls over. And so I did what any kid would do in that situation. And I flipped the table over and I punched him right in the face. <laughs> and in my head, when I did that, I was like, I let America down. And then I thought about it and I had used excessive force against someone much weaker than me. <laughs> which is the most American way to end a conflict ever, right? I immediately felt horrible. I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I, you know, I'm not a violent person. And from the back of the room, I hear, ooh. And that ooh is international, right? When you're a kid, you know that ooh means you're in trouble. And I look and I see my brother there. And he said, I saw everything that happened. And the next time you piss me off, I'm telling mom and dad. So a week later, I pissed him off. He ran to my mom and dad, he said, Mom, Dad, I just want you both to know that last week, Zane hit a kid and he's been hiding it from you ever since. And my mom looked at me and she said, Zane, is that true? And I said, Mother, I cannot tell a lie. I did hit that kid. But I will have you know that when it happened, Zafir was there and he's been blackmailing me with this information ever since. <laughs> and my brother in the back of the room, he was like, fuck, that was good, that was good. I did not expect that. <laughs> my mom looked at my brother and she said, Zafir, we are so disappointed in you. <laughs> Zane would never do something like that. <laughs> Very close to my mom, man. She was there. She was there when I got into my first fight. It was also, it was in a mosque. In a mosque, Kanif, for those of you who know what that is. So in a mosque, it was after Friday prayers. After Friday prayers, this is what happens. Everybody kind of hangs out, socializes, all the kids play. And I'm a kid, little kid. I walk into one of the rooms, and I see a kid my age hitting my little brother on the head. 
And as an older brother, if you see your little brother in a fight, you have an obligation to get involved, right? But I am what you would call a pussy. <laughs> so I ran to my mom because I am also a snitch. <laughs> and I said, mom, somebody's hitting Zafir. And she goes, well, we gotta make it right. And I was like, oh man, now I gotta go to this kid, shake hands with him, pretend to be friends. And we find the kid and my mom bends down and she says, I heard you were hitting my son. Is that true? And the kid in front of all his friends, he goes, looks like the Sharif brothers need their mom to fight their battles for them. And then my mom goes like this, she goes. And then she slaps the shit out of this kid in front of everybody in the mosque. Yo, this slap was so loud, his soul left his body for three seconds and came back, right? The irony is we're in a mosque and this is the most spiritual experience he's ever had. And look, as a kid who got his ass beat by his mom his entire life, I cannot describe the joy of watching her hit a kid that wasn't hers, right? I was in the back like, oh, do it again. Okay, now there's a scene. Now this kid's mom comes running and I was like, oh no, now his mom is gonna hit my mom and my mom is gonna kill her. <laughs> and she looks at the handprint on her son's face and she goes, did this woman hit you? And before her son can answer, my mom goes, uh-huh. Why? He was hitting my son. And she said, and you thought that was enough of a reason to slap him in front of everybody in the mosque. And my mom goes like this, she goes, Somebody had to. Most gangster shit I've ever heard in my life. I got goosebumps. Now that kid's mom raises her hand. Everybody's wondering, oh my God, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Moment of tension. And then I swear to God, she turns and she slaps the shit out of her own son. And she says, apologize to this woman for making her hit you. And now this kid has to walk out of the mosque with two separate handprints from two different middle-aged Indian women. And the reason I like this story is because there are two misconceptions about Islam, right? One is that it's a violent religion and the other is that it oppresses women. And this story does not help the violent part. But these women are not oppressed, right? They started a fight club in a place of worship. And I don't know what happened to that kid. But I wouldn't be surprised if after getting slapped in the middle of a mosque, you turn into like a religious extremist. <laughs> Probably, right? Like 10 years from now, there's like a grainy video of him with a big long beard and an AK-47 in the background. And he's got a bunch of followers. And he's like, women should not vote. And everybody's like, yeah. And he's like, women should not drive. And everybody's like, yeah. And he's like, and women should not slap their sons in the middle of the mosque. <laughs> And everybody's like, that's kind of specific. <laughs> All right, guys, this has been great. Thank you so much. You guys have been awesome. <laughs>